Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Fraser Rath, and I'm visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College, as well as the executive director of the BGHRA. It is my true honor today to introduce to you a student of mine here at Davidson, Olivia Howard, who will be providing us with the introductions to each of our guests um, at this morning's panel. So Olivia Howard, uh, with pronouns she, her, is a current undergraduate student at Davidson College, where she is pursuing a double major in biology and German studies. Olivia began working with the BGHRA during the summer of 2021 and continues to be a part of the organization as an intern. You'll hear more from Olivia and um, our other interns on Sunday at our final panel to close out the conference. In the meantime, I'm going to turn things over to Olivia to introduce our wonderful panelists. Olivia? Thank you, Dr. Frazier. Um, I will introduce our first speaker, um, Aika Sly. Aika Sly is completing her PhD in English Literary Studies Department at the University of Cape Town, where her research revolves around communicability and the po politics of self-translation. She is also interested in the representation of magical events, indigenous knowledge, and animist materialism when expressed via English or German, even though the author's point of reference are people who do not speak European languages. The title of her dissertation is Decolonizing Magic While Keeping It Real and the Selection of African and Native American Novels Written in English. Her presentation today is entitled Africans on Zeus Gutsa. Please help me in welcoming Aika Spy. Thank you. Um, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. I am so honored to um, be part of this. Um, I will jump right in because when I rehearsed this, it took exactly 17 minutes to read this um, short story that I wrote last year after the international school, uh, the German international school in Cape Town went through um, a sort of upheaval and student protest and parent protest because of racism um, that had surfaced at last. Um, so I will jump into this um, satirical short story. The title is um, Africans on the Zugspitze. This is what explains it. Remember how Otto von Bismarck invited everyone to Berlin for the conference of the century back then in November 1884? Round table discussions, speeches, carving up of the continent. Yeah, all of that. Most people don't know though that the year before when Otto was planning the whole event, some of his advisors were of the opinion that Germans were Christians and in the spirit of the golden rule, it would be a wise gesture to offer up a small piece of German soil to some Africans, just so nobody could say it wasn't a reciprocal project, you know, the colonialism project. A memo went out to all the regions of Germany, who would be willing to offer up some land for reverse colonization? Out of all places and provinces, it was the village of Schmölz and its handful of devout families that insisted the Africans must come and feel at home at the southernmost tip of Germany, nestled right up against the highest mountain amongst the Alps, the Zugspitze. And so it came that a delegation of 22 Africans made the long journey from tropical Bagamoyo to icy crisp Schmölz. It was decided to carve out a giant plot of land halfway up the Zugspitze where the Africans could spread out and set up their colony. Places of worship came first, then commerce, business, and then they built a school. Naturally, their kith and kin followed. By the time Otto was done with his conference in 1885, the population of Africans on the Zugspitze had quadrupled and they were thriving. You see, 
Africans, man, you know how they are. They come with gifts and bling. These folks showed up with ivory and gold and some stunning sapphire colored diamond like gemstones that we call tanzanites today. The Germans couldn't get enough of that stuff. Before you knew it, their nobility and all kinds of herrenvolk placed their orders. Money started pouring in and the Africans put that profit to good use. They renovated their school and boy, oh boy, it was glorious. What a campus. As the 20th century rolled on and over the world, this school continued to grow and upgrade. The very best teachers were hired from Africa, state-of-the-art enlightenment classrooms, science labs, assembly halls, and a giant sports complex. Fast forward to 100 years after Bismarck. There it was, the most prestigious educational institution in Germany, the African International School. Spacious classrooms with heated floors, an entire campus for the humanities, and bulletproof curricula. Its graduates were guaranteed the very best jobs and university careers. Forget about entry-level salaries. If you graduated from this school, the international school on the Zugspitze, you could skip right ahead to managerial positions in the workforce or second year in university. It's therefore no surprise that the people of Schmelz and beyond wanted a piece of the pie. Given that this international school had emphasized the I for international in its acronym, the school's administration was obliged to accommodate the Germans. So they patted themselves on each other's backs when the time came to officially open the German stream. In the name of internationalism and inclusion, it was now possible for regular Schmilz folks to enroll at the school. Next thing you know, all of Bavaria shows up and then some. There was celebration and excitement. There was plenty of feeling good about doing the right thing. It was German soil after all. What possible excuse could justify not letting Germans access some of this best education in the country? It was also understood that since Germans are accustomed to free and public education, the school fees at the, school fees at the International African School on the Zugspitze would present a hardship. The African school administration was well prepared, though scholarships were available and a healthy, wealthy donor base committed to sponsoring the German kids. The school also decided to host an annual fundraising event, a giant extravaganza in the summer, when plenty of tourists were around. All kinds of meat were roasted, palm wine, fufu, pilau, pup. It was a lovely pan-African display of food, fabrics and fun. Originally, this event was called the African Bazaar, but that quickly generated the moniker Bizarre Bazaar, and the school administration settled on Jamba Jamboree. Perhaps that's when this problem started. The German stream students did not quite feel at ease during the Jamba Jamboree. To get in, one had to pay an admissions fee that was quite a lot for the middle of the road, middle class family. But the whole point was that it was a fundraising event. So the Africans said, and after all the admissions, the admissions proceeds would benefit the Germans. The Germans objected to being cast in a light of neediness, destituteness, or in need for charity. Okay, okay, the African admin team said, how about we generate free passes for those who can't afford to pay? The free passes were printed on bright yellow paper, and now the Germans complained that it was too conspicuous. It led to the same kind of embarrassment they felt in line at the cafeteria where all the African kids simply flashed their ID cards that had money credit loaded onto it to purchase any snack or meal of their choice. When the German kids bashfully swiped their ID cards, red lights would come up on the machine, signaling a free lunch kid for everyone to behold. Sure enough, there were a few exceptions. There were a few German students who came from wealthy enough families to afford the school fees and cafeteria money as well. But they often suffered from the pressure of their peers asking them to buy a sweetie here and there. It became evident that the German students did not feel at ease at the school as a whole. In class, at the cafeteria, in sporting events, students tried their best to articulate this unease. Parents tried too, but it was hard to put one's finger on what exactly was causing their unease. 
then there was one German stream student for whom the unease actually developed into disease. This student complained that she was suffering from gastrointestinal stress symptoms that completely diminished her appetite. Even if the cafeteria had offered German foods like her favorite Kartoffelklöße mit Rouladen und Rotkohl, she would not have been able to stomach it. It was this student that first used the term second class citizen to describe how she felt as a member of the German stream. A number of students followed suit and reported similar feelings of unease, alienation, embarrassment, discomfort, and feeling out of place. The Afro admin team hosted assemblies and forums to address the issue. They listened to the students' complaints and assured them that their feelings stemmed from a place of perhaps feeling outnumbered and thus very visible. Sticking out like sore thumbs isn't fun for anyone. The same German student with the tummy problems interjected to say that it was the exact opposite. She felt entirely invisible at the school. What do you mean? I see you, I see you right now, yelled the principal, Mrs. Shui Shui, known for her huge Afro and eloquence. The student tried to stutter back that there were no German teachers at all at the school and that none of the authority figures, leave alone management figures were German. Instead, the entire cleaning staff was German, janitors, cooks, dishwashers, trash collectors, tra landscapers, plumbers, security guards, they were the Germans. Mrs. Schweschwe retorted that there were two German teachers on faculty. There was Klaus, the sports teacher, and Clotilde, the flute instructor. Yes, mumbled the student inaudibly, but why do you call them by their first names and all the African teachers get the respect of Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so? The fellow students around her nodded their heads in support, but were of course intimidated by Mrs. Shui Shui's afro and gaze. Everybody knew it was impossible to win an argument with her. She had the most natural way of interrupting her opponent's sentence. And even if one got the opportunity to speak fully, Mrs. Shui Shui would always pretend to be actively listening, reiterating what she just heard you say. And then she would turn it into something slightly different during the reiteration. She also had a way of always demanding evidence for how the students were feeling. What's the proof for the second class citizenship, huh? She would demand in a tone that foreclosed any dialogue. The German students became exasperated. Many of their parents were too nervous to lose the generous scholarships. It did say after all on the scholarship award letter that the school retains the right to retract a scholarship if the students somehow brought the school into disrepute or failed to participate adequately in the activities that made the school great. Jamba Jamboree implicitly included. This pressure around scholarships was a sticky issue nobody wanted to talk about, but it was widely known that when German students were pulled into disciplinary meetings or academic warning meetings, the school's accountant was quietly present without explanation. An array of intimidation dynamics unfolded and German students became less and less likely to speak up about their experiences. While their silence became as thick as a fog hanging over the campus, the incidents of perceived discrimination added up, up, up. Perceived became one of the Afro administration's favorite words to use. The discourse shifted to speak about perceived microaggressions, perceived exclusionary practices, perceived injustices. Like the time the German boy clearly won the swimming race, but the referee said he saw the African boy come in first and that there must be something wrong with the German's perception of what had happened. All the time a group of Germans distinctly heard an African call them a certain slur word and complained about racism, only to find out that Mrs. Shui Shui dubbed it perceived racism and refrained from taking any further action. German students started showing signs of depression. They spoke about their feelings in hushed tones, tried to support each other and make each other laugh, but that too landed them in trouble because more than once, an African teacher reminded them that German was a foreign language and that it was inappropriate to speak German on campus, given that the majority of Africans barely understood it. But we are in Germany, the German students thought to themselves. 
African teachers never bothered to learn how to pronounce German names. Some of them didn't even get the simplest of names right, like Elke, Heike, or Silke, always leaving the ambiguity around purposeful mispronunciation or simple couldn't carelessness. Many German students started showing strange behavior patterns. Some of them shaved their heads, and when asked why, they lamented that they were sick and tired of the daily comments about their hair texture and the occasional petting that was inevitable, especially when having long hair. There was one year where it became a trend among them to wear contact lenses that made their eye color appear brown. One can only assume that they felt uncomfortable with their piercing blue eyes in a room full of black and brown stares unease, stress, a general sense of not belonging. Some went as far as saying the school culture was toxic, especially the racialized power dynamics. There was a slight increase in cannabis use amongst German students. For several students, that became the only stress coping strategy. However, it was pretty clear that the African smokers hardly got caught, and they were rarely disciplined when they did get caught. German students, however, were frequently stopped and frisked. Overall, they faced greater scrutiny. They frequently were singled out for wearing the school uniform incorrectly, for example. When something got lost or was perhaps stolen, Africans were quickly so to suspect the Germans. In one case, a German teacher declared that an African teacher declared that a phone had gotten stolen and that all the German backpacks needed to be searched. An African ally intervened and asked, why are you only searching the German backpacks? And the teacher replied, rich people don't steal. The story goes on and on and on. Macro and micro aggressions piled up higher than the Zugspitze. And one day, a straw broke the proverbial camel's back. It happened in a life skills class, ironically. The teacher told the class that Germans have inherently lower cognitive abilities than Africans and are thus less likely to succeed in school. The kids couldn't take it anymore. Both African and German students decided to file a complaint, but when no adequate response was issued from Mrs. Schweshwe's office, the students saw no other avenue than protest. They wrote anti-racist messages on their backpacks and t-shirts and silently protested for a week before some parents started wondering about what was going on. Now, one parent, a certain Mr. Krimskrams, was so outraged that he decided to tell students they had done enough and that he would call upon parents to carry on the thankless work of protesting. And so it came that Mr. Krimskrams and several other German parents began a peaceful protest, demanding to know what's going on and insisting that the school should do something about all the penned up grievances. Mrs. Schweshwe's Afro admin team immediately went into defense mode as opposed to leadership mode, retorting that internal issues should not be made public and that labor law needed to run its natural course. Long story short, the German parents, as well as many African parents who were keenly aware that this conflict was playing out on German soil, refused to simply go away. They demanded answers, transparency, accountability, diversity, for how can it be that we are on German soil and Germans are hired to do all the maintenance and cleaning jobs while the absolute majority of the faculty is African? How dare Mrs. Schweshwe suggest that competent German teachers and counselors are hard to find? Like most protests, this one divided the community into those who sympathized but didn't want to join, those who couldn't join, and those who got hella mad about the embarrassing exposure on the internet and national news. Countless German alumni and former parents emerged and said, this happened to me too. It was traumatic to go to that school. The hella mad people insisted that the grievances were just made up, a matter of perception, a typical case of cancel culture. They labeled the protesting parents as those on the street and developed a narrative that made the protesting parents out to be a bunch of ungrateful, hysterical rogues. Mr. Krimskrams disenrolled his son from the school in disgust, and he sang all the German folk songs he knew on his last trip up the hill to the African International School on the Zugspitze to fetch his son's belongings. 
alle Vögel sind schon da. Ein Schneider fing eine Maus, hab eine Tante aus Marokko, Hira, Rutsch, Hoppe, Hoppe, Reiter, Summ, 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 der Kuckuck und der Esel, drei Chinesen mit einem Kontrabass, zehn kleine Negerlein. He knew it was the right thing to do. Nevertheless, he hoped that all those students, parents and teachers at the school who knew exactly how much rot should be aired out and exposed would continue demanding fundamental change. A few months later, when he found out that the school had enhanced its motto and logo to include the word Ubuntu, an image of rainbow hands and the face of Mandela copy pasted all over, He was not sure if this signaled a step towards progress and redress for all that his son had gone through. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aika. We will move on to our next speaker, Judy Van Brock Billingsley, born to a white German woman and a Black American soldier shortly after World War II. Judy Sambro Billingsley was abandoned to live in a kinderheim until adopted and brought to America. She was raised and educated in Bakersfield, becoming a teacher in the Kern High School District. After 20 years in the classroom, Judy moved to Sacramento, California, where she was accepted as an administrator in the administrative career, retiring in 2008 as a high school principal. Her personal journey and in international re research to find her birth parents were revived after her retirement. Judy Sambro Billingsley holds a Bachelor of Arts degree, a California Lifetime Teaching Credential, and a Master's degree in Education Administration. Now residing in Elk Grove, California, she is the mother of two successful sons, two successful daughter-in-laws, and the nana to four grandsons. A member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, a member of 100 Black Women of Sacramento, She finds time to serve her church and community in many ways. Please help me in welcoming Judy Sambro Billingsley. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, uh, all of you for inviting me, Rosemary. And uh, I want to say good morning to everyone. It's morning where I am. I live in uh, California, the United States. And California and Sacramento is the city and the capital of California. So it may be evening to some of you. So hello. Um, I just wanted to share uh, that um, a little bit of my experience um, in researching my um, family tree and also uh, tie race into it because as I listen to all of the speakers, um, I know that race is a big thing with all of us. And uh, so, All of us humans uh, must answer the question, who am I? Our sense of identity affects everything in our lives. From our choices to the values we live by, our identity is our all-encompassing system of memories, experiences, feelings, thoughts, relationships, and values that define us. So I ask all of you, who are you? Besides identifying yourself by your career or your status of motherhood, fatherhood, married, divorced, student, widow, um, who are you? Many people answer this question because of the family pictures, family get togethers stories that are passed down from generation to generation that allows you to put yourself within that family spectrum in some way. But when abandoned and adopted as I was, I lived in a kinderheim for some uh, several years of my life. Um, and being adopted, answering the question, who am I, is not automatically answered. This basic need to know our identity, and I really think I hear that throughout as speakers are speaking, and I've attended some other Uh, conferences uh, that are much on the same theme of, of our identity. You know, what do you identify as? You know, what are the issues? And who do you identify as far as family? It helps to ground us, to center us, to give us the confidence to succeed in life. So I was born, just to tell a little personal piece, uh, the reason I'm starting with who am I, 
is uh, I was born Uta Schaub in Germany, in Friedberg, Germany, actually, shortly after World War II to a German woman and an American, um, Afro-American uh, US soldier. Uh, World War II, as you guys know, began in Europe in 1939. Uh, the United States got involved in 1941 due to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, war ended in 1945. So this war was unique because it was the first war where thousands of children were born and left behind. During and shortly after the war, about 37,000 occupied children were born throughout Europe and about 5,000 in Germany, and my sister and I were two out of those 5,000. Both Germany and the United States considered us a problem. We were children without a country, despite our German citizenship. And for some of you that Google or certainly are aware of German history and US history, um, Germany did dub us as brown babies. And I know that uh, for some people that is not exactly the best to call us. I have put in here in regards to occupied children, but most of these us occupied children were biracial. Um, and for me, it was the United States with my father and birth father and my German mother being German. I lived in uh, St. Joseph, Kinderheim, uh, Germany uh, for a while. Um, a black Cadillac came by in our village and stopped for a minute and uh, we were picked up and put, literally picked up and put in the back seat of the Cadillac. The doors were locked and we left our village never to see our mother, our sister, uh, our babysitter, any of the friends that I played with in Bingenheim Village in Germany. And uh, that's where we were until we were adopted. As um, I was adopted and brought to the United States, and I'll call my adopted father daddy because he was my father, he raised me, um, many, many years later handed me a shoebox uh, literally a shoebox full of all of my papers. Uh, they were in English and they were in German. German, of course, and then translated into English. And that was the significant emotional event in my life that began my odyssey of self-discovery. Through my discovery, um, I found uh, both of my birth parents. I found that I had five other siblings. I also discovered that uh, my grandmother, who was Ashkenaz, full Ashkenazi uh, Jew, had died in the Nazi concentration camp during World War II. Researching and finding out who I was was really important to me. Uh, racism was deeply ingrained in Germany, just as it was in the United States. Um, and Therefore, uh, some of that was based upon the racism was based upon my birth mother uh, giving us up for adoption. When I visited the village where I spent some time, uh, lived with my birth mother for a while, um, I was surprised when I went back as an adult and found everyone, I was really surprised that they all came rushing out and they remembered uh, my sister and I. But looking around, I also realized one of the reasons they did remember my sister and I is because we were the, I was the only brown baby in that entire village and brown meaning the skin color of brown and they remembered us. I did feel like I was at home. It was a part of me that I'm German and I needed to find those roots as well as very much being entrenched in United States roots as well. And I had a great uh, parents who adopted my sister and I. Um, they, my mother was very much into Christianity and my father was a businessman and they both really helped us in regards to being able to what we call code switch and being able to live in white society, 
but also be able to live in African-American society. My parents uh, moved into a neighborhood where actually the KKK burned a cross on their front lawn. So very much aware of racial issues, not as much for me in Europe as you're talking about. I'm learning that from listening, but I'm definitely very much entrenched and very much aware of racial issues and, and occurrences here in the United States. Um, very much involved in the civil rights movement. My parents were lifetime members of the NAACP. So I was able to see the both sides, both sides meaning living in both um, uh, white and uh, African-American um, society. Returning to Germany, I did explore my beginnings um, and that's how I resulted in uh, writing my memoir, Too Brown to Keep, A Search for Love, Forgiveness, and Healing. And the memoir describes my odyssey, the quest and finding birth of both of my birth parents. I know I say that in a simple sentence, but it took me a lifetime to find them. Uh, my American father who was here, birth father lived here in the United States. And thank goodness he still spoke German and everything and had contacts and he is the one that helped me find my um, birth uh, mother, Elsa. It helped to answer that question, who am I? I had that question all my life because I knew part of me was missing. Uh, by writing down my journey, it provided me the opportunity to reflect on my heritage. It also provided me uh, an opportunity to write to leave a written legacy for my kids and for my grandkids and any kids that come along after that, my legacy actually. I also, in this book, um, it led me the experience to write a thought provoking chapter uh, on love, forgiveness and healing. And that was really important to me uh, because when you're abandoned, there's always those abandonment issues that come um, up. And so it was very helpful for me to be able to research, listen to people. I went to Germany every other year for many years, uh, interviewing people, seeing sites where uh, Mannheim, Germany, going there to visit the orphanage, St. Joseph Kinderheim, and do a lot of my research. So it was really helpful. And I have to say that uh, I did find peace. Uh, I found myself as a whole person uh, and uh, very peaceful uh, now. I also have in my book, tips and lessons learned on conducting genealogy research as well. And so I speak to many groups um, throughout the United States and um, other places in regards to not only my memoir, but also on genealogy research. So any questions, I'd be happy to answer, but thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. We will move on to our next guest, Dr. Heidi R. Lewis. Dr. Heidi Lewis is Director and Associate Professor of Feminist and Gender Studies and Integral Coordinator of Early Career Faculty Development Programs at Colorado College. Her areas of specialization are feminist theory, politics, and discourse, and discourse particularly Black feminism, hip hop culture and discourse with emphasis on rap, and critical media studies. She has published in The Cultural Impact of Kanye West, The Journal of Popular Culture, The Journal of Black Sexuality and Relationships, and Indivisible Eight Alliances Against Racism. She's also the author of forthcoming essays examining FX The Shield, VH1's Love and Hip Hop, Bravo's Married to Medicine, and the Relationship Between Expertise and Women's Studies. She has contributed to Mark Anthony Neal's New Black Man, NPR's Here and Now, Rich Media, and act out and has given talks at Vanderbilt University, the Motherhood Initiative for Research and Community Involvement, Cornell University, the US Olympic Committee, Portland State, and other organizations and institutions in the US and Germany. On that note, Dr. Lewis's first book, and Audrey's Footsteps, Transnational Kitchen Table Talk in Berlin, co-edited with Dana Marie, Maria Alsbury, and Colorado College alum, Jasmine Tate Andrews, was recently published in Innenberg Bachman Prize winner, Sharon Utu's Witness Series. 
Please help me in welcoming Dr. Heidi Wu. Thank you, Olivia and Rosemary and Emily and all the um, conference organizers. And thank you to all the attendees, which I browsed through and saw Vanessa, Vicky, Michael, and, and my student, Judy Fisher, um, who, who traveled to Berlin with me twice in 2017 and 2018. So thank you to all of you. It, like Judy, I'm, I'm a little further west, so it's early for me. Um, on that note, before I get started, I do want to acknowledge that I exist and work um, on the unceded territory of the Ute peoples with the earliest documented peoples of the land, including the Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne peoples here at Colorado College in Colorado Springs. Okay, so fun fact. I'm a black woman with a German name. How many of you thought I was white when you saw my name on the on the um, conference program? Um, my maternal grandmother unknowingly foreshadowed the book that Olivia just mentioned um, and the work preceding it when she asked my parents to name me Heidi because Heidi, the 1937 film featuring Shirley Temple in the title role was one of her childhood favorites. Another fun fact, the Swiss author German language book on which that film is based was published in 1881, 100 years before I was born. You might be able to imagine the challenges that posed for me when I started sending messages to black women and women of color in Berlin asking to connect due to my interest in creating a study abroad program focused on transnational solidarity <laughs> and intersectionality. If not, let, let me help you. In 2014, the first year I taught my course, Rhea Cheatham and I stood outside smoking and I asked, why didn't you ever email me back when I wrote asking to meet you last year? She took a puff, chuckled and said, I thought you were a white woman. And I said, who is this white woman from the United States trying to find out things about us? What does she want? She and I laugh about that to this day. Still, it is critical to recognize the seriousness of that concern a concern shared by many Black Germans and Germans of color that stems from the ways their experiences and their work has often been exploited, ignored, and erased. Another fun fact, Rhea and I also laugh because I hardly speak any German, unlike my colleague, Dr. Tiffany Florville, who, according to Rhea, speaks perfect German. Tiffany and I joke about that now, too. But unlike Tiffany, I didn't begin building relationships and doing work in Berlin until just under a decade ago. In fact, I didn't get my first passport until I was in my early 20s, married and a mother of two. When I was in college, I never attended study abroad information sessions because I couldn't afford it. I also never considered seeking financial assistance because traveling abroad seemed frivolous in relation to my academic interests, even though I knew many black intellectuals I was learning about had traveled and even lived outside the US. It wasn't until I began studying Black feminism more intentionally in grad school that I discovered how much time Black lesbian mother warrior poet Audre Lorde spent in Berlin every summer from 1984 until she died in 1992 when I was just 11 years old. After learning about Audre in Berlin, I honestly didn't think much more about it other than remembering my father and other Black men in or close to my family spent time in Germany during their time um, in the US military. Still, I hadn't reached a point where I could see what was to come and years passed before I would think about Audrey in Berlin again. Fast forward to when I found myself employed at Colorado College in 2010 and I secured a tenure track position there two years later. I started settling in and thinking about how I might contribute to the overwhelmingly white study abroad curriculum at this very well resourced institution where most students study abroad at least once regardless of economic circumstance. Shortly after I received funding to begin the process of thinking, studying, planning, what eventually would become my course, Hidden Spaces, Hidden Narratives, Intersectionality Studies in Berlin. Unfortunately, I hadn't been able to seriously study a second language, something that's especially difficult when you're educated in impo impoverished public schools in the US. So I knew I had to teach in a country where a great deal of people speak English. And that's when I remembered Audrey and got busy reading, thinking, and studying. I read Showing Our Colors, Afro-German Women Speak Out, edited by Katanina Oguntoye, Ma Aim, and Dagmar Schultz. I read Ma Aim's Blues in Black and White. I read Ike Hugo Marshall's Invisible Woman, Growing Up Black in Germany. 
I read critical texts by Marion Kraft, Yasmin Edding, Professor, Professor Dr. Maisha Alma, Dr. Tina Camps, Cassandra Ellerby Duke, and so many others who had written about Black people and communities in Germany. Finally, I discovered the Witness series and read The Little Book of Big Visions, edited by Sharon and Sandrine. I read Olumide Pupula's also by Mel. I read Nzitu Mawaka's Daima, and I knew Berlin was the place and that I had to go. When I first started articulating my interest in Berlin, some people weren't exactly curious about it. They were puzzled. Berlin, what's in Berlin? People still ask me that to this day. With their ill-informed expectation being I would be more interested in Paris, London, or Rome but that didn't concern me. As with most things in my life, I knew it would make sense to them eventually or wouldn't, and that would be okay too because it made and still makes sense to me. But when some black intellectuals in the US, including black feminists started asking the same question, why Berlin? I realized my work might be more important than I was and still sometimes am willing to admit. I make that point because their questions were mostly genuine. They were asking to better understand me and my work. But like me, many of them just didn't know W.E.B. Du Bois had studied at Humboldt University from 1892 to 1894. They didn't know about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preaching a sermon on both sides of the Berlin Wall in 1964. They didn't know East Germans sent boxes of letters to Angela Davis while she awaited trial, or that she was greeted by an estimated 50,000 supporters in East Germany when she visited after her acquittal in 1972. Last but certainly not least, they didn't know about Audrey. So again, I knew that Berlin was the place and I had to go. Prior to my first trip there with my husband eight years ago, last November, since 2013, I, spent I sent several messages to people asking to meet and discuss my interest. My book, In Audrey's Footsteps, Transnational Kitchen Table Talk in Berlin, wouldn't be possible without many of them, some who are featured or honored in the book. While some were as skeptical of me as Rhea was at first, some still are to this day, they have all been so generous, caring, thoughtful, and loving. They've taken time every year to share their knowledge and experiences with me and my students, who we affectionately refer to as the Femme Geniuses in Berlin. They supported me professionally when I was pursuing tenure, and when I've experienced racist sexism at work, they comforted me when I was disappointed in students and when I was disappointed in myself. They loved on me when I thought my personal life was falling apart and they held me accountable when I made mistakes and caused harm to people I love and who love me. I knew I would make many connections in Berlin. I even knew the course would be successful in ways I and my employer would define that, albeit distinctly. But I didn't anticipate how my relationships with the women in that book, relationships that started out professionally, would come to mean so much more to me on a personal level. I knew I would find comrades. I didn't know I would find friends or sisters. And then came the project. On May 13, 2016, just a few days before I left to teach my course for the third time, my friend Aisha Shahida Simmons texted me and said, I wish I could have a live stream of you in Berlin. I, want, I would want the behind the scenes footage. Soon after, I decided to create a project featuring my friends in Berlin and our relationships. Despite, Aisha suggest, despite Aisha's suggestion, my first thought was to publish an edited collection in which each of us would write an essay or other kinds of pieces communicating the significance of the world we've been co-creating. But while I was in Berlin, I couldn't stop thinking about her text and decided to create a multimedia project that would allow audiences to read our words, see our faces, hear our voices, and feel our energies. When I learned one of my former students would be returning to Berlin in 2018 after having went with me in 2016, we discussed how to bring that project to life with their support as an audiovisual engineer. That summer, they collected thoughtful and beautiful photographs and audio and audiovisual recordings of seven conversations oh, of seven conversations between me, my co-author Dana, and our brilliant friend. Transcripts from those conversations were edited by me and Dana and developed by Jasmine Tate Andrews, another one of my former students who came to Berlin with me in 2015, into the prose that has now become the book. So the book is essentially seven chapters of actual conversations that we had in real life that mirror 
um, conversations that we have every summer when I go back. While I never have intended for my work to mimic Audrey's, the first part of the title acknowledges the ways I'm indebted to and aim to honor her legacy. The second part was inspired by Kitchen Table Women of Color Press, which started with a 1980 phone call between Audrey and Black lesbian feminist writer and activist Barbara Smith. During the call, Audrey said, we really need to do something about publishing. And Kitchen Table was created and given its name because the kitchen is the center of the home the place where women in particular work and communicate with each other. And that's a direct quote. Further, the founders of Kitchen Table Press, which also included Chedi Maraga, Hattie Gossett, Lietta Lone Dog, and others, wanted to situate themselves as a, quote, grassroots operation begun and kept alive by women who cannot rely on inheritances or other benefits of class privilege to do the work they believe they needed to do. This is evident by their description of the press, revised in 1984 to note, quote, our work is both cultural and political, connected to the struggles for freedom of all our peoples. We hope to serve as a communication network for women of color in the US and around the world. Similarly, most of the conversations in this book happen at kitchen, table, kitchen tables or over meals to reflect the true nature of our friendship and to honor the tradition set forth by the elders and ancestors who continue to make our cultural, political, and personal work possible. With In Audrey's Footsteps, we offer ourselves as another communication network in service to the struggles for freedom of all our people. In doing so, we grapple with the contours of solidarity, friendship, processes of radicalization, critical pedagogy, the challenges of building and resisting simultaneously, romantic partnerships. I talk a lot about my husband in this book. When he gets to chapter six, we're going to have to have a conversation. <laughs> Motherhood, knowledge production and dissemination, and so very much more. We do this not to provide answers or solutions. We do this not in pursuit of sameness. We do this to generate ideas and questions. We do this to nurture the kind of dialogue that has sustained us. And we do this because, as Audrey points out in Showing Our Colors, to successfully battle the many faces of institutionalized racial oppression, we must share the strengths of each other's vision, as well as the weaponry born of particular experience. First, we must recognize each other. And before I conclude, um, I'll say that we have a Twitter page, an Instagram page, and Facebook page um, where people can get information about the book, updates on where we'll be to talk about the book, events we'll do, but also snippets from the book, including some audiovisual clips. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> some audiovisual clips from the conversations in the book. The conversations were two hours each. And so I would say that the chapters in the book are probably about 30 minutes of that. So a lot of the clips um, give insight into parts of the conversation that aren't in the book and that will be part of the multimedia um, aspect of the project that I talked about before. Um, Jaslyn, is in the process of creating a, st a study guide for the book um, for various audiences from audiences from students in college classrooms, high school classrooms, activists, artists, um, sort of as a support for uh, sort of offering support for how to generate conversations around the book, create po projects related to the book. Um, and one last shout out, I do want to say that I was be honored doesn't seem to capture it, but I was honored to have um, Rhea, Yasmin, Judy Gummich, and um, Ika wrote the forwards to the book. Katarina was unable to write the afterword to the book as we planned. So Sharon and I wrote a love letter to Katarina Ogunsoye that concludes the book. And then the rest, of course, the tops off chapter one, or Sharon wrote the preface, but it tops off, of course, with Generation of Defra is in chapter one. And then um, you can look at the stuff and see um, what else is on there. Yes, it's available on Amazon, Kindle, Barnes and Noble, digital copies. And so with that, I'll conclude and take any questions once we get to that portion of the, of the, of the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. We'll move on to our final guest, Jordan Awori. Jordan is 33 years old and an independent abstract artist, designer, and activist. Jordan is a queer Kenyan woman living in Frankfurt, Germany for a little over a year. 
Trained in interior design, she now works as a design business growth specialist to empower and connect female design entrepreneurs across cultures. Please help me in welcoming Jordan Awori. Everyone. <sighs> okay. I'll first begin by saying thank you. This is actually the first time I've ever watched the whole film after I was done editing it and everything because it's, it's extremely difficult for me. Like, a, yeah. I, so first I just want to really say thank you for giving my film, my voice, this opportunity to be showcased. I, I've been living in Germany for one and a half years. Now, having lived for 31 years in Kenya, um, surrounded by blackness on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I was taken out of it, there's just a lot of things that I still cannot articulate. So I have an abstract of the piece because I also created the piece more for every black person in the world who feels something and doesn't know what they're feeling and there are all these feelings and there's just everything and there's joy and there's fear and there's anger and there's sadness and everything and so I do not want um, this to be about me I want this to be about you watching this so I will read you the abstract yeah I'm really extremely emotional right now, guys, but yes, okay. So Raw is a short film, illuminating, acknowledging, and celebrating Blackness. As a work of art, Raw explores Blackness that emerges from the individual and collective experiences of the African diaspora, mainly focused on Germany, where I currently reside. It seeks to bring to life the complex and sometimes contradictory emotions that that are both endured and enjoyed when living in the diaspora. Situations where, in all honesty, I have unfortunately felt that blackness and all that comes with it at times is merely tolerated rather than accepted and celebrated. Raw deliberately, sorry, Raw deliberates on these emotions, weighing up both the negativity of the black experience and also its beauty. In the piece, you, the viewer, sees versions of me emerge from an emotional and raw outward expression, occupying, understanding, embracing, fighting, and supporting me through them. I deliberately filmed it in a very simple format, actually just using my iPhone, in a time when I was completely emotional and overwhelmed. I created raw as a testament to the power and beauty of emotions in its truest form. I desperately created my debut, debut film as a show of strength and vulnerability. Although I want you, the viewer, to have your own interpretation of the piece, it should not be one where you feel sorry for anyone adorned with beautiful black skin. And I will say that again, you should not feel anyone Sorry for anyone adorned with beautiful black skin. I want to make it a thousand percent clear that this is not a plea of acceptance. This is a show of black, black beauty, fears, strengths, turmoils, joys, and in all its rawness. It's a message from a black person to all black people in the diaspora. As is evident, I have used no recognizable language in raw, only noises that universally convey an experience. Noises that say more than words could ever say. Noises that are raw. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And Jordan, um, for sharing that beautiful film. And you can see in the comments um, that I think it's resonating with, um, well, it is resonating with a lot of people. Um, very, very powerful. Uh, on this panel, um, modestly called 
political activism through cultural production. We've seen um, narrative satire, um, memoir, interviews, and film um, convey various messages about experiences and um, histories of Black people in, through, around, um, related to Germany. And so at this point, I'd like to invite anyone um, who has any questions to please submit them through the Q&A function below. And I'd like to um, forefront questions for Aika um, because unfortunately there's an, a planned power outage where she is um, and, and she'll be likely kicked off here in about 10 minutes or so. So if anyone has um, um, questions for Aika in particular up front, um, let's let's go there. There is one question um, awaiting us though in the Q and A, and um, this this is for uh, Judy. How long, Judy, were you in the Kinderheim, and did your adoptive parents travel from the U.S. to get you and your sister at the Kinderheim, or uh, did you have any other siblings growing up at home in Bakersfield? This person will definitely get the book and is fascinated by, um, by the experiences that you shared. Do I, uh, do I just, do I answer it? Uh, I don't have a yeah. proper answer. Okay, <laughs> I just, I Go wasn't sure it. what the format was. It's my first time. Um, um, let's say it, I, if I remember all of the questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, my sister and I, um, we were uh, both given up for adoption. We share the same mother and same father. The rest of the other five siblings same mother. And so I was uh, in the Kinderheim. My parents uh, adopted both. Thank goodness for that. We were blessed to be able to stay together. And we flew from um, Sister Melba, I actually researched and found all the people that were involved in my sister and all of our adoptions. And so I have a picture, and I have pictures in the book. So I have a picture of my sister and I and a few others boarding the Scandinavian Airlines plane to America. So we uh, flew to New York, uh, sight unseen uh, on both sides. So when we landed, the stewardess um, handed my sister and I over to our, uh, Potential adopted parents they hadn't adopted us yes, but said yet, but said they would, and so that was the first time they saw us, and that was the first time we saw them. And I think there was a question about uh, oh, and then later on down the line, my parents did adopt um, another girl, not from Germany, although she is part German, but she lived in Bakersfield, California, and her mother lived there. So uh, there's actually three of us girls. I hope Wonderful. I answer. <laughs> yes, and everyone be sure to get uh, get her book. Who um, Brown to Be, A Search for Love, Forgiveness, and Healing. And I put my information in the chat. Thank you. Uh, so here are some questions for Aika before, <laughs> before you leave us. Um, Aika, what, what has been the response from others to your story about um, reversing the power dynamic here? Um, well, the, the story is only known by um, people who were part of the protest, but it is um, strategically, it's going to be published next week in a, in a, in a popular newspaper here. And we, we are aware that it's going to cause quite a storm. Um, there's a large German um, community in Cape Town that has a very old history, literally going back to the 1880s and before. And um, as I found out the hard way, um, I, I, I can't quantify it, but it seems like a majority is, is, um, is still surprised to meet Black Germans um, and is, is relatively um, uninformed about, yeah, about um, the kinds of suffering that come with 
you know, having survived apartheid, for example, in South Africa, having gone through some of the most brutal kinds of oppression, and yet, um, yeah, to answer the question, we we expect quite some fallout, especially in the sort of in the more conservative um, corner. But we, yeah. We will, we will see how, how it sits. But the fact that journalists are eager to publish it and also there's an invitation to be on a local radio show um, to discuss it further um, is encouraging. Wonderful. And um, this, this is also a question of translation here um, for both Aika and Judy. So are there plans for um, either or both of you to translate these stories into other languages, specifically German? Um, I Yes, definitely. And actually I've been looking, so maybe somebody can put in the chat and suggest, uh, I did go to try to do some German publishers but no one picked it up. I self-published myself on Amazon, but I am looking for it to be translated. Mm. Um, yes, on my side, I, I plan on translating it myself and I have started, but I find myself creating a rather a, a different story all over again for the German audience. Um, and so I'm sort of dealing with, in, in this, I'm questioning the authenticity then of, of doing that, um, it, it sounds very different in German and the German language itself also make, makes some things possible, you know, that are lost and gained in translation. So, um, but I will work on it. I feel encouraged now that, you're, that someone is asking about it. And um, yeah, I wonder if it would land in Germany and how. <laughs> and can you remind us the name of the magazine again? That it'll be published um, it's in? The, yeah, it's the Daily Maverick. Um, it's, it's, yeah, the Daily Maverick. I'm assuming it, it's just a South African paper. I'm not sure if it's an international publication. <laughs> and we're getting comments. Please translate that story and um, make it available to a broader audience. Okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, all right. What other questions do people have here? <laughs> so I have a general question for everyone and maybe again I I, I don't know um Aika if you'd like to start but um but for all of you what um can you speak a little about the the medium that you're using here to tell either um, your story or in your case Heidi the stories of um of Black German women in the feminist movement in particular uh, you know, we have, again, satire, um, a memoir, interviews, and then um, this beautiful short film. So can you speak more broadly about the medium that you're using and, and what that allows, you know, um, you to convey and, and maybe um, some of the, the sort of complicated questions of representation there. So I'll ask I guys to go first because I think we have one minute with her and then we'll go on. Oh, um... Shame, I really wanted to hear from um, Dr. Heidi and also Jordan. Actually, I, I, I will relinquish the mic and hope that okay. the power stays. I, I really <laughs> wonder about um, yeah, the, the film medium and also the academic article and what that does for you, Dr. Heidi. Go for it, Heidi. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'll just say for me, um, somebody asked about that in the chat or in the Q and A, and I answer, referencing the um, um, critical race theory practice of counter storytelling, um, which people um, and I cited uh, people in the in the in the Q and A um, employ in order to tell the stories of people um, whose whose stories haven't typically been told in various spaces and places, and so for me, it, again, I thought I would do an edited collection, have everybody write, but then I started thinking about 
everybody's different circumstances and, and, and lives and thought that's a pain in the ass. I mean, you know, write something and revise something and write something again and revise something again. I'm the scholar who has the luxury and privilege of time. Not all, most of the people in the book do not. Um, they're working full-time jobs, raising kids and everything. They don't have sabbaticals and summers off and all that stuff. So I thought, well, we talk every summer, we spend time together every summer. This is just what we do. So can I get your permission to just record that, but based on a set of questions that I detail in the introduction? And everybody said yes. And so that's that's basically what we did in order to make this process um, as convenient as possible for the people in it, but also because we agreed that we would give audiences a certain part of ourselves that 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 only we knew, right? It's not what we teach students. It's not what we talk about with them or that it's not how we write in academic articles. Although I, I tend to write a little more like I am in my, in my academic stuff. Um, so that's why we chose what we did. And then of course we wanted to have, um, we wanted to give audiences an opportunity to see it and feel it as well. So we recorded them audio visual and, and, and we transcribed the, 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 um, the recordings, got the big long transcripts polish those up and then we started editing the clips in order to share with people on all those social media pages. So for me, it was based in the scholarship that tells us what story, the significance of storytelling, but I'm black, I'm black American. So storytelling is what we do. We toast tell all that stuff. So it also gave us an opportunity to be ourselves and share parts of ourselves with with our audiences and so the, I'll, I'll i'll get allow jordan not allow but jordan can speak in case i guess power goes out <laughs> um for me mine will sound deeper than it actually is the art form came to me i didn't go to it so what happened was a friend um shared this the the conference and the fact that they were filmmakers they should submit something and i never actually created a film but I watched a lot of the events and I felt like I had a community that I was like outside of and I just like watched the events and then, okay, go off my life. And then I was just still confused and stuff. Um, and then one day I had a complete nervous breakdown. Like I, I, I really just couldn't function for, for, for a few hours. And I just took a camera, I put it on a tripod and I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried, and I cried. And it was the first time where I, I felt like it, there was just a release and it felt beautiful. And then like my creative juices, because I, I paint, I write a bit here and there, um, I design, but then this was the first thing that felt less about the world and more about me, but then brought the world in it. I, I do not know how to explain it because then when I, would paint or create art, I'm looking at it based on, will this look good enough to be displayed in some gallery somewhere? Will I become a millionaire from this art? Will people come and talk about this? And da, 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 da. But this was the first time it did not matter. It didn't matter how I looked like, I was rubbing off my makeup and all the insecurities I have with my blackness, with some parts being darker than the others and whatever it may be just didn't matter. And the next thing I knew I was grabbing a wig and putting it on and I was laughing and I was smiling and the next thing I was, I was just being me. And then when I was done, it just, it really felt robotic. I can't really explain it. And I edited it and I sent it to my friend and I just thought, okay, I'm done. I've sent it, whatever. They'll, and they loved it. And I didn't care what they felt because they are white and I was like this isn't for you I don't care whether you love it or not I care for people who look like me who like I, I told how to feel when they're not in their world and it and then I just sent it off and since then every I've created another film and I just love it and I'm doing it for me for people who are like me or who aren't like me to understand that we are just not one thing. Like, I just hate the fact that we are described as one thing, you're queer, you're black or you're this and you should all think like this. And it, this is just my way to express that without any words, because evidently I speak a lot and when I start, I can't stop. So yeah, that, 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 that was it. That's like my, my summary of the answer, yeah. <laughs> 
Amazing. I love it so much. Um, Heidi, did you have something to, to add here? Yeah, or say? Yes, and thank you so much for that, Jordan. I feel I feel that so deeply. Um, I'm I'm real tangential, but the other thing I wanted to add to was that the course, like the book, has always been a collective process. Um, I remember early in my experience, it is who's in the book, and I have friction because somebody was trying to get in the middle of us to keep their person of color to themselves. The white woman, of course. I mean, they do that a lot, and. So she was being fed this information that I was coming to Germany to teach about Black Germans, which how, I don't know, especially at the time, I didn't know anything about Black Germans. And I was being told that she was mad, da, 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 da. and we talk about this in the book. Um, and once we built a relationship on our own terms and started to share information with each other ourselves, we realized what was happening to us. But she became a bigger and bigger part of the design of the course. Like the, the title of my course, it, it, we came up with that. We come up with what the students do. I bring in my knowledges and they bring theirs and we do this sort of exchange. And the, we wanted the book to be like that too. And so it was really important for, I mean, they had input from everything to the order of the book, who goes first, who goes where. And so I think when when people are asking about those choices, that was a, a that was a, one impetus for the choice was for it to remain collective. Emily, to your question, but I wasn't exactly honest when I first answered your question. It was easier for me to to do it this way to get transcripts and work with those as opposed to writing everything from scratch and da 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 da. Now it did get really, really difficult for me to take those transcripts. Once we took out the parts we wanted and kept the parts we wanted, it got really hard for me to make it prose. And I buckled. I mean, I had a, I was like, I can't do this. Fuck this. I'm done. I, th this, this will never happen. It's meant to be with us, not the world. And a friend of mine said, what about Jaslyn? Jaslyn, who's third author on the book, she was a student of mine. She went to Berlin with me, met several of the people in the book, and she's an amazing writer. And I said, oh my God, I never even thought of her. So I just sent her a text like, hey, you know, I'm working on this book. Would you like, if I pay you, would you like make the pros? And she was like, yes. Watched all the videos, listened to all the clips, wrote, I mean, I couldn't believe it. So I'm saying that to say, everything collective isn't like that. And like I said before, part of the book gives us an opportunity to talk about some of those contentious contours of solidarity. All solidarity is not roses and flowers and getting along. I've had fights with people in this book, like not this fights, but fights. But when it's beautiful, it's really beautiful. And so that is, it, so it wasn't just about like, you know, the reason I chose to do it this way was convenient for me, convenient for them. And it allowed everybody to participate and play a role. It wasn't all on my shoulders. It's one of the first things I've ever done where everything wasn't all on me. And so that made it amazing. I'm just sitting over here just like loving everything you all are saying so much. Um, feeling a lot of energy here. There's, yeah, teamwork makes the dream work. It's in the chat. I mean, absolutely. Um, to Jordan, there's a few more questions to you um, in the chat or in the Q&A. So a question for Jordan, can you say a little more about the hair and self-styling choices in the film? So you mentioned the wig, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then also, um, uh, did you define yourself as Black before you went to Germany? Um, okay, the but first one, um, in regards to the hair and the styling, I, I just like different hair. I just, I, so that's just was more my personal thing. And there were like wigs around and it also helped me express the different versions I feel that are in me. So that's where it came from. And yeah, I just, I like, I like wigs. I like the fact that you can have straight hair, short hair, long hair. Like it was just, it was fun and gave me the opportunity to have all these personas um, in the film. Um, in regards, did I define myself as black before I go to Germany, before I went to Germany? Yes, but because I, I'm um, married, or at that time when I was still in Kenya, I was dating uh, a white woman. P.S. this is the first time that 
outwardly the world will know I'm queer. So ta-da, this is my official coming out to the whole entire world. Yeah, that's done. Um, <laughs> um, and so because of that, what was extremely interesting is I loved the fact that she would say I'm black. I would say she's white. Like it's it's our skin color and it's like, but then a lot of um people um a lot of white people would feel like oh sh- should should she say you're black or oh, she and and that, it was a very interesting thing so that made me really solidify my I am going to constantly state I am black that was even when I was still in Canada what what is wrong with me being black I, I don't understand why that's the thing you would question if she said I'm short would you be like oh are you saying like I I'm I'm black. What what is wrong with that? So yes, before I ever came, I was completely adamant in being defined as black, and I loved it. And in all honesty, that really helped me in Germany because living in Frankfurt, a, a lot of the people around me are international. So more often than not, I may be the only person in a space who is black. And I want to be recognized as the black. I'm, I'm. It's a beautiful thing. I, I love it, and I love the fact that I, everyone around me, I have made people comfortable enough to define me as such and to do it in such a beautiful way. So yes, I, I knew I was. I defined myself as black. I defined myself as black, and I will always define myself as black. Yes. Well, I really do hope that we get to see all of the films that you create from now on. Um, and I'm so looking forward to reading um, your book, uh, both of your books, um, Judy and Heidi. Uh, Heidi, it just came into the library today, actually. So I read it. <laughs> and um, and thank you, Aika. I mean, when you publish that your piece when it finally is published um please send that to us and we'll you know disseminate that everywhere for you as well so I just feel like this panel has been such a celebration of cultural production and just creativity in general and I cannot thank you all enough thank you all um, to the panelists. Thank you, Olivia, who did an amazing job doing the introductions today. I'm so proud of you. Um, and thank you to um, all the conference organizers and obviously especially to Dr. Kenya. Um, and for everyone who joined us this morning or this evening, wherever you are. So the next, um, the next panel will start at, oh God. I don't know when it will start. Oh, I'm on the wrong day. That's why. <laughs> okay, it'll start at 11, 11 Eastern. So whatever that means for you. Um, we have 15 minute break here. And then please return um, to join us for remembering and forgetting, uh, or sorry, um, a panel on, yeah, remembering and forgetting colonialization and so on and so forth. So thank you all very much. And we'll talk soon. And thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.